that are here in Trieste and who is following us uh, in streaming. And uh, welcome to this panel in which we would like to understand how artificial intelligence could enhance and improve healthcare systems. So, so first of all, it is uh, important to understand what uh, uh, an uh, artificial intelligence is. Uh, AI, uh, the so-called AI, are systems, softwares mainly, that can uh, uh, somehow learn how to do a certain task from the repetition of a, a certain task for several times and from the information that it receives from the environment. And uh, there are several kinds of uh, artificial intelligence. Maybe you heard about uh, Deep Blue, that uh, is a software that, uh, software that more than 20 years ago defeated uh, in a, an epic challenge uh, the chess champion uh, Kasparov. But nowadays there are a lot of uh, artificial intelligence. For example, there are uh, cars that are driven by these softwares and uh, these systems are used also uh, within the healthcare uh, world for uh, diagnostic and uh, uh, also therapeutic uh, purposes. Uh, they use the so-called big data and it's important to understand uh, so how this system could enhance also our life, our daily life. And uh, among the different applications that we can think about uh, when we talk about uh, AI, one of the maybe most suggestive one is uh, uh, the one is the interaction with the robotics, in especially human robots. And uh, uh, Professor Sgorbissa and uh, Professor Papadopoulos, that uh, is uh, uh, connected. Uh, hello, hi, Chris. Nice to see you. Uh, we'll talk uh, about the innovative researches that they are doing within this field. But uh, these systems, as we said before, using big data and connected with uh, certain hardware, can also could also be used uh, within healthcare systems to help uh, people uh, that are particularly fragile or uh, uh, sensitive to isolation. And uh, uh, Michele Flaborea and uh, also Su Yan Yang will, uh, will talk about uh, such systems. Uh, so, uh, hello, hi, nice to, 
to see you as well. And uh, so now I would like to have a, a brief uh, introduction from each of the speakers in order to better understand uh, who they are and uh, what they are doing in, the, in this field. Uh, so please, uh, I think that uh, Chris could make now a brief uh, introduction. Okay, hey, yeah, thanks. thanks for having me here. I'm really happy to be here. So yes, my name is uh, Dr. Chris Papadopoulos. I'm a principal lecturer in public health at the University of Bedfordshire. And I do most of my teaching on our Masters in Public Health course, in particular the Research Methods and Health Protection Units. Um, and I also lead the distance learning version of our course and supervise a number of our uh, PhD students. Um, I have many research interests, but broadly speaking, I like to conduct research that produces evidence on how to support the psychological well-being and the mental health of vulnerable populations, especially when it comes to innovative solutions as a result of multidisciplinary thinking. And that's why I really jumped at the chance to join Antonio's team in the Caresses project that he led um, because it offered a really exciting and groundbreaking opportunity to design a novel randomized control trial to test and evaluate uh, something really, really uh, new and potentially impactful uh, on a vulnerable population uh, that really does need a lot more support and many more solutions than they, than they are currently getting. I'm talking about older adults in care, care settings here. Um, I'm really excited to talk about the, po the project, in particular the trial, the randomized control, uh, controlled trial that we conducted and some of the key findings and some of the connected issues. So thanks for having me here today and I'm looking forward to it. Okay, thank you Chris. Now please, Antonio. Okay, uh, thank you, Chris, and um, my name is Antonio Gorbissa. I'm an uh, associate professor at the University of Genova. First of all, I wish to thank Televita for inviting me to this panel to talk about uh, our research. And my background is in robotics and AI from the point of view of autonomous behavior. So in the past, I worked a lot uh, with uh, mobile robots, robots with wheels for autonomous transportations, for instance, in hospitals. And more recently, in the last years, I started to work uh, with Chris also in the social robotics domain, which is uh, the aim of building robots that may interact with people in uh, everyday life. And uh, for this, I was the coordinator of the um, uh, Caresses project that was mentioned before. And uh, just to give you an idea of what we are talking about, I would kindly ask to uh, send a video. In the video, there are many writings. That's because the video is meant to be self-explaining. So if at some point it's too long, uh, please, Michele, tell me, and we can maybe uh, cut it. <laughs> so I kindly ask to send the, uh, to show the video. The, the first one. A little bit of suspense.
Tell me what kind of situations make you feel happy. Lovely, lovely to be with Pepe. And I'm very cheerful lady. I love children. I'm happy to be surrounded by the children. I like lovely music. I don't like to be alone. Before, because I was born in a very big family. countryside during the Second World War. I was wondering, do you remember that time? Yes. Please, tell me what was the most difficult thing that you and your family had to go through during the Second World War? Well, the most difficult thing was that we were a family of four, a husband and wife, and a little boy, me, and my younger sister. And my father, who was 29, was conscripted to go into the Royal Air Force. And then they posted him to Iraq in the Middle East. And we didn't see him for three and a half years at least. Sometimes I visit the churches. I know that many Indian people meditate sitting on the floor in the corner of lotus position, usually on a small mat or carpet, with eyes closed and back straight. Yes. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Please, tell me more about your table, the one which you keep in your living room. Yeah, it is, it is, if you wish I will tell you, it is very small table. I have two tables. Actually, three tables. Please tell me the title of the song, the artist or the genre you would like to listen to. Chuck Berry. And then I had the pearl fishers, oh, classical, nice. absolutely beautiful. I told to my children that I have the company of Pepper. Pepper is so adorable and he is a very good companion to me. Just say one word, yeah, sorry, so just, just one word. The video you saw, which was a bit long, sorry, because it was for the internet, where 
it is taken from real experiment with people. So it's not a video that we made for adver advertisement. Okay, it's footage taken during real world experiments and Chris will talk about this later. Yeah, okay, thanks for this first contribution that uh, I think that uh, we, can, uh, we can understand with it what we are talking about in a few minutes. Now we would like to uh, have an introduction about the healthcare systems such as Televita that uh, are uh, specifically designed to assist uh, elderly people or people in needs in general. Please. So, good morning everyone. My name is Michelangelo. I'm the project manager for Televita. And today I'm honored and really happy to be here with Marcello, Antonio, Chris and Misu from Shanghai uh, to talk about uh, Televita and talk about what it has done in these years in the field of smart healthcare systems. And uh, it has been a pleasure to join forces and understand what are the future steps and the future perspectives, not only for Televita, but for smart healthcare in general. So now I would like to ask to play the video that's going to have a, um, an introduction to Televita and uh, what we do. Taking care of people. We have been doing it since the beginning of our journey. We help them, we accompany them, we assist them. We provide them with the latest technologies so as to facilitate their everyday life. We are by their side every day because we know that being there gives security. We create a relationship based on trust. We keep them company and we help and address an important information regarding their health. Supported by advanced technology, we deal with chronic difficulties at a distance, whether they be physical or cognitive. We receive daily updates on vital parameters and monitor any value that may become critical, verifying what might have happened and, if needed, alerting the emergency services. When prevention is not possible, we do our best to help those in difficulty. We provide services and initiatives on the territory that aim to safeguard the disabled, helping them become more independent and fully integrated. Our main priority is prevention. Together with a team of psychologists, social workers, and qualified operators who use the most appropriate means of communication, we intercept and handle difficulties, providing counselling when necessary. Our staff is at the service of people with the best technologies available. We have created a model based on taking care of the individual in order to improve the life of the community. We have been doing this for over 30 years. For this reason, we regard Televita as a life of constant and dedicated attention towards others. Okay, thank you Michelangelo. And now we would like to have a brief introduction from uh, Mrs. Uh, Su. Uh, good morning, dear guests. This is Jiang Yansen, Group Chairman of Shanghai Homey Swallow Health and Tech Corporate Limited. I'm very honored to participate in today's summit and I'm very glad to have the opportunity to speak as Televita's Chinese partner among so many distinguished experts and scholars. Uh, 
，现有员工四百余人，在集团下面旗下有九间子公司，其中众以健康注资一千万元，是我们中意合资的公司，主要从事呼叫中心的业务。燕归来致力于中国的健康养老产业，经过五年努力，现已成为中国境内养老和康养服务的知名品牌。Shanghai Home Swallow Health and Psychop Limited was founded in January 2015. Registered capital is 9,800,000 euros. We have 400 employees and nine subsidiaries. Among them, Homi Vita invested 1,200,000 euros, which is the Sino-Italian joint venture company mainly engaged in call center business. Homi Swallow has always been committed to China's health and elderly care industry and has now become a well-known brand in China's pension and health care industry. We and Vita are in China the company. 目前主要开展五五项业务。说吧。Our main business and service groups of Home in Vita includes five service systems softwares. 一是 Telica， 远程照顾系统。该系统服务主要是紧急救援、远程关爱、牵线搭牵线搭桥的服务。First line is Telecare. The system's function includes emergency rescue, remote care, matchmaking services. The second thing is SOSIS, the social service system. The use of the phone to provide the social service information to elderly people is provided by the government to help elderly people to provide social service information. Secondly, it's SOS, sales. Use the telephone to provide searching and consulting services for the social public information service system for the elderly. This software is social public service platform software that assists the government in undertaking convenient services. The third service is Global Service Life Support System. This service system is mainly for managing the elderly and care services for our services. 为高龄老人，特别是食能和那个呃高居家养老的老人，提供生活照顾和医疗照顾服务。Thirdly, is global service. The software manages home care service organizations and service items that provides home care and medical care services for the elderly, especially the very old and the disabled people. 第四项业务是。为弱势群体服务的管理系统，该软件是专门为残疾人等弱势群体和老年人开发的软件，为弱为残疾人提供特殊的服务，包括免费呃电话呼叫、呃康复管理、用药监管和陪同服务。Fourthly, it's Amelia. The software is specially developed for the disadvantaged groups, such as the disabled and elderly. It provides special services for the disabled, including free phone calls, rehabilitation management, medication supervision, and accompanying services. The fifth service is Telemedicine, the health care management platform. This service is focused on connecting the digital health system and the remote care system management system, and the mobile network. 传感发射系统形成方便快捷的居家生化指标检测和健康管理，通过互联网、物联网实施远程会诊和远程医疗咨询服务。Lastly, is telemedicine. The software uses wearable devices, telemedicine video systems, and international thin sensor launch system to realize convenient and fast home biochemical index detection and health management. And provide remote consultation and telemedicine consulting services through the Internet and the Internet of Things. We are with Homeveda in China. The joint company Homeveda is now working well. It has already entered the normal operating path. Five systems have achieved the Hanhua and have obtained the Chinese patent. 
通过改善服务模式，汉化软件呃管理软件以及优化系统，实现了适合中国国情的智慧养老、居家养老的管理平台的建设。At present, the above five service systems have been finished Chinese localization and obtained the software copyright in China. Home Invita has realized the construction of smart elderly care and a home care management platform that is suitable for China's national conditions by improving its service model, Chinese localized management software, and optimizing the system. We are currently 委托呃第三方采购服务，一项是牵线搭桥服务，即我们的客人呃有事要给我们打电话，有紧急情况给我们打电话，所以呼叫中心是二十四小时为我们的呃客户服务。第二个是我们主动关爱服务，我们为独居的老人或者是高龄的老人呃提供主动的打电话服务，通过我们的服务。为老人提供了安全感，让他们觉得什么时间都有人来关爱他们。第三个是防老人的防摔倒服务，就是我们的西套餐，实现了一件他只要一摔倒一件功能，呼叫我们能够及时的上门提供服务。嗯、um, ，Thirdly, the mingling, uh, the main service object, the business of the call center mingling for government procurement project. We have won the bid twice and have practiced as the operator of the Forever Happiness Project by Civil Affairs Bureau of Songjiang District, Shanghai, China. The project includes three services packages, A, B, and C. Package A is matchmaking service. The package is provided for the elderly people over 60 years old. The service helps to set up a rapid connection between social service resources and the needs of the elderly people. Secondly, the package B is active care service. This package is provided for the elderly people over 80 years old who are living alone or severely disabled elderly or lowest social guarantee level. And thirdly is package C, the smart watch within the life service number stored to realize one key calling function. The package provides public information inquiry service for the elderly. Okay.那个电力台呃健康科技集团旗下九间呃公司，其中包括医院为居家老人提供的护理站，呃也是个医疗机构，还有养老院呃社区养老养老中心以及呃康复中心。Okay. Okay. 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 以及呃我们的呼叫中心，还有一些生活设施。燕归来实现的是线上线下相结合，会员和开放相结合，国内外资源相结合，呃，这个传统和现代技术相结合。所以我们对老人的智能养老 AI 技术也是非常感兴趣。Uh, Shanghai Home in Swallow, we have nine subsidiaries, which including hospitals, senior daycare centers, and uh, home in vita call centers. We are very interested in developing high technology for elderly care and health management platforms, especially for AI technology. This教育中心已经成为我们集团的数据中心，成为我们的信息呃那个信息的呃传递中心、沟通中心，也形成了我们服务的协调指挥中心，更是老关爱老人们的让爱心的中心。所以我们的话务员叫天使话务员，呃我
and will also continue to integrate more high quality sources to form a more complete line around the themes of home elderly care, rehabilitation and health care, and caring for vulnerable groups. We will continually construct, uh, construct the data centers, service coordination and the command centers, and the communication and the care centers for the online and offline services. We keep to focus on exploring smart and health home care models suitable for China. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, as you may already understood, we started to go into uh, uh, the details of these uh, healthcare systems uh, and uh, how they can uh, um, help people from different uh, uh, social environments and also different ages as uh, Mrs. Su talked about. Uh, but I would like to, to do a little step behind, uh, talking about now with, uh, with Antonio about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, uh, robotics uh, and uh, how can uh, be used within this context. Okay. So, I stand if I can. Yep. <laughs> My presentation. Uh, can I ask this introduction? Yes. Does it work? Okay. So what I will talk uh, you about is the, uh, the, the aim of the Caresses project, which is to build robots, social robots that can be companion to older people. And in particular, as you maybe noticed from the video, we are very interested to make culturally competent robots. So the idea of building companion robots, uh, it's a quite uh, common idea in the robotics community. So what are uh, companion robots for. For instance, they may be used for detecting emergencies, the person forgot that there is a, a pot on the fire, or other kind of emergencies like a fall, or maybe the robot could also remind the person about taking pills, or about uh, a phone call or a visit to the doctor, or even remind the person that Christmas is coming because Christmas is very important, right? Maybe the person must buy presents for um, his or her grandchildren. And so the robot would remind the person about Christmas who is coming. Or even remind, Christmas is not the only tradition, right? The robot may remind the person about the birthday of the emperor, which is another very important tradition, or about recipes. Maybe the person knows about how to cook, but doesn't remember very well how to prepare the, 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 the ingredients from the recipe. So this is something that the robot can help with. Tack. It doesn't move. Okay. Or it may put the person in contact with technology by reading from online news, for instance. Or even put the person in contact with a, a relative and so on so the very important thing is that in doing this the robot cannot substitute human caregivers this is not possible even for technological reasons and we don't it's not our objective the objective is to uh, reduce the burden of caregivers uh, so this is what the robot can do by helping with some cognitive things. For sure the robot cannot uh, do co uh, physical tasks and however it's not our objective to substitute human caregivers. So you may have noticed something that may have confused you. For instance the, crisp, the, the, the birthday of the emperor. I don't know how many of you know the, uh, about the birthday of the emperor. This is a, a Japanese tradition. And this brings us in the core of, of our, our objective which is to build robots which are not only autonomous, not only capable of interacting with people, but also culturally competent. So the robot must know the culture of the person. What does it mean for a robot to know the culture of the person? But maybe the robot can know that different actions are performed in different ways in different cultures, like greetings. The robot may know that different topics of conversation may be more or less relevant in different places. Ah, or the environment can be different, the food can be different, or again, traditions can be different in different places. So, for doing, oh, this is a killing example. In this example, you have a person which has fallen, this is for sure an emergency situation in most Western countries, 
but for instance in an Asian, in a Japanese traditional house, this may not be an emergency and the person is exiting in the same situation, in the same position. So if you are using a, an algorithm for detecting situation with a camera, the situation may be similar, but if you know something about the culture of the person, they may be different, very different. So what about cultural competence? Uh, what is cultural competence? This is not a term used only in robotics, it's used also in nursing, but the idea is that the robot should know that there are different people with different cultures, and people with the different cultures, they share some similarities, you can see that they are all green in my slide, but then culture takes a different form in different persons. And the robot must understand which is the individual characteristic of the person by avoiding, of course, stereotype representations. So this is our objective, how do we achieve that? Sorry, the important thing is that we do did it with Pepper, but this may work also with other robots uh, in principle even with the evil robots, why not, or not, an, oh, not anthropomorphic robots or smart coffee machine, why not, smart Italian coffee machines or even smartphone, smartphone application. So the same concept can be applied in very different domains. So how do we achieve that? Oh, the idea is that we have a, a, a cultural knowledge base which is in the cloud and the robot, Pepper or maybe any other robot can connect to this system and in the system there are many concepts related to different culture for instance related to food for those who are interested in technical details this is implemented in the system as using an ontology which is a structural way of representing knowledge but not only of course of course not only food even sports or even beliefs religion and the idea is that the robot should know that in different cultures, some maybe religions are more probable than others. But of course, we want to avoid stereotype representations. So this is not a, a sharp definition. This is not deterministic. They are just mass probable. And the robot will assume that maybe the person may be interested in talking about this. And for those who are interested in the taste, this is done using Bayesian networks in our systems. So, one peculiarity of our system is that every concept in the knowledge base is associated with sentences that can be composed by the system automatically to increase the naturalness and the versatility of the interaction. So, the person, the robot may ask confirmation about the taste of the person, in this case, do you like animals? Or the robot, it will, it will do that very frequently, may ask the person about, uh, uh, the, about his or her life or may ask confirmation about the values of the person or even may suggest to, to start an activity. And if this is what the person wants to do, the activity will start. You saw some examples in the video like playing the memory game that you saw already in the video. A very important thing for us, very important objective is to make a system which, which is fully autonomous. When you see robots in videos, many times they are remotely controlled or scripted. Everything you see here is fully autonomous in the sense that the robot uses sensors to detect what's going on and then take decisions fully autonomously. Now, Chris will talk you about experiment we did in, uh, with the real people in the care homes in UK and Japan. I want to show you a short video in my lab to uh, see how we, what we mean by autonomy because the, what we, you saw in the previous video the robot was not moving a lot was only talking but please see this video to see a more complex interaction and I cl close conclude my talk with this video if it starts yes it starts Namaste, Pepe. this is me huh? <laughs> I'm pretending to be an Indian person Do you want to know the weather in London? Yes, Pepper. So now it's proposing something. All right, I'll show you the weather in London. It is cloudy currently. The temperature is 7 degrees. Okay, thanks, Pepper. That's very kind of you. Our version of Pepper likes to talk a lot, unfortunately. So we have to make it go forward.
Help me to get dressed better. Do you want me to help you while dressing? Yes, Pepper. I am happy to be helpful. You look very elegant when you wear your sweater. It's Please, definitely true. tell me how you feel when you wear your sweater. I feel very elegant, as you said. I need some privacy now. Please. Are you sure that you need privacy? Yes. I, do. I will help you in this. Thank you, Pepper. Please, touch my head when you want me to turn back again. Don't look at me. I need to go out. Goodbye, Pepper. Shall I go to rest for a while? Yes, Pepper. Goodbye. Okay. It has been a pleasure talking with you. My Goodbye. My pleasure, Pepper. So this is to give you a, an idea of the continuous work, in the sense now the robot goes back to his... Hello, Pepper. I'm back. Did you just call me? Yes, Here Okay, and so on, possibly, possibly forever. So I think I move to the last slide, which show the, all the partners of the research project, which are here, and you can see Dr. Chris Papadopoulos on the top, because he was a partner, as well as, as, well as all the other partners. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And now Chris will talk to us about uh, uh, experiments and the researches that have been conducted using these kind of technologies. So please, Chris. Can you see my presentation? At the moment, we, we see you. OK, now we see the presentation. Yeah. OK. OK, so yes, um, I'm going to talk through the randomized control trial that the Caresses project uh, conducted. Uh, and I'm going to specifically talk about uh, the health-related impact of our culturally competent, artificially intelligent system that we embedded into uh, the Pepper robot. But as Antonio said, it could go into any robot or other domains, and we tested our system in older adult care homes. So real people, real settings. Okay, so this aspect of the project, um, the testing and evaluation phase in particular, was led by the University of Bedfordshire and also Advinia Healthcare. Both of these partners are UK based. Uh, the aim of the trial was to conduct and evaluate an experimental trial aimed, aimed at exploring if and to what extent Pepper robots that employed our system, our caresses system, could produce better health and well-being related outcomes among older adults residing in long-stay care homes compared to a control robot and also compared to care as usual, as in people that didn't receive any robot intervention. Now, just a quick note, uh, in terms of the control robot that we compared our system against, this was a difficult opponent for us to uh, compare the system against. So we made sure that it possessed all of the same functionalities as the, ro the Caresses robot in that it was exactly the same robot. It was the Pepper robot. It could play music, it could play videos, it could um, converse, et cetera, et cetera. But it didn't employ those functions in as a, a effective way in terms of cultural competence as the caresses robot. So we made the system, let's say, less culturally competent, but still a, a very functional, capable robot. So it was a difficult um, opponent. Uh, in terms of um, the trial design, it was a mixed method, single blind, parallel group trial, uh, which was employed within, as I said, long-term older adult care homes, both in England and Japan. And we, of course, obtained ethics approval, both from the UK and Japan, but we also um, secured approval from our uh, care home providers that participated and made sure that we followed all of their uh, procedures um, and so forth. 
very importantly, we first conducted a pre-trial pilot study to assess the preliminary feasibility and acceptability of our procedures. Um, we learned a lot from this pre-trial and that subsequently led to a number of procedural and technical improvements that we then employed in the main trial. The main trial then took place in 2019, across the year of 2019, and data analysis was completed in early 2020, and we're now currently writing papers. Okay, so what kinds of participants took part? So we had a very strict set of eligibility criteria, namely that residents needed to be aged at least 65 years or older to qualify as an older adult. They needed to reside in a single occupancy bedroom or single uh, bed bedroom area within the care home. It, it was very, very important that participants were unlikely to express aggression to themselves, the robot or the researcher, and that they possess sufficient cognitive competence and sufficient physical health to take part. And of course, they needed to be able to verbally communicate either in English or J Japanese, depending on trial site. Um, in terms of how we identified and screened these people, uh, we had a two-stage screening process. The first stage involved care staff who knew the residents very well, making nominations as to who they believed met these eligibility criteria, followed by our research team meeting with these staff and talking through with them various staff-based questionnaires that um, assessed cognitive competency, frailty and aggression in a valid and reliable Way. Um, so ultimately, the participants that did take part were randomly allocated to one of three different um, groups. The first group was the experimental group. Now, this is the group that received the fully fledged caresses, fully cultural, culturally competent experimental robot. Um, as I said, there was also a second robot group, the control robot, and this was called control group one. So participants allocated to control group one received our control robot. And those allocated to control group two didn't receive any robot whatsoever and continued as normal. Participants and care staff were both blinded to group allocation to reduce bias and participants allocated to receive a robot. So, so I'm talking about the people either in the experimental group or the control group one and receive the control robot. These people had six sessions with the robot that were spread across two weeks at convenient times for the residents, with each of the six sessions lasting for up to three hours, with participants free to use the robot as much or as little as they wished during these times. So essentially 18 hours in total across two weeks. Nine care homes uh, in England and in Japan uh, agreed to take part. Um, ultimately, across these homes, 134 residents were nominated initially by care staff, 99 of whom ultimately passed both screening stages. Um, overall, however, 33 residents fully participated in the trial. Um, and those people belonged either to the English culture, these were 15 of those, the Indian culture, 15 of those, or the Japanese culture, three of those. This meant that the recruitment rate was 33%, 33.3%. And in terms of baseline um, group socio-demographic characteristics, um, we tried to ensure through stratified random sampling that these characteristics would be fairly balanced and ultimately they, they were in terms of age, gender and educational level in particular, which was quite good. Okay, so I'm going to just briefly talk you through some of our key health related um, results. Okay, and I'm just going to start off by talking through um, the, as I said, the health related quality of life results, which was measured by the SF36 instrument, which is a very widely used uh, and validated, reliable international measure of health related quality of life. Um, and I just want to point out here, there's a lot of numbers here, but I just want to point out the fact that the SF36 measures both physical health and mental health. And as you can see here, if you look at the bottom column, uh, the no robot group saw a significant decrease 
um, over time, so that's be be just before they started using the robot, and, oh, sorry, I'm talking about the no robot group. So this is over the two week period. So during these two, two weeks, these people that didn't receive a robot saw a significant decline in their mental health. That's the important thing to note. So the lower the score here, the, the worse their particular um, outcomes are. So you want to see higher numbers. Um, whereas the participants that received the robot did not see a significant decline in their mental health. So that's quite pleasing. However, you might also see there's no significant differences, no notable changes when it came to physical health. So we didn't really see much in terms of physical health, but mental health, for sure, uh, there was a difference. Now, when we look at mental health more uh, specifically, and we break it down into the four subscales that mental health um, is measured by, uh, there were some really interesting findings. So I just want to highlight here the two red uh, rectangles to start with and as you can see here we had um, 12 people in the experimental group okay so that's the second column uh, here and these people so this is these are these are the people that received the fully fledged caresses robot and as you can see here we saw a notable increase in their mental health uh, when measured by emotional well-being so this is the most important measure of mental health emotional well-being and really taps into psychological well-being which is really really important and so between baseline which is just before the the, the moment they started using the robots um, and up to the point that they finished using robots across the two weeks yeah, as you can see their their emotional well-being um, uh, increased quite considerably whereas those again that did not use a robot saw a considerable decrease in mental in emotional well-being um, here again we can see some some differences again the people in the experimental uh, robot group saw some increases in their mental health in terms of role limitations and energy and fatigue whereas again those without a robot saw considerable decreases in their mental health um, however, it was um, uh, also interesting to note that the people in the control robot saw a significant decrease in terms of role limitation, emotional subscales. So this is the subscale that measures um, the impact that emotional well-being has upon the everyday uh, role tasks that one um, conducts. So these people in the control robot actually saw a decrease in that particular measure. Okay, so now just moving over to the ANCOVA statistical tests, which are actually a, a stronger, more powerful uh, form of statistical uh, testing. And what they do is they test the magnitude of score change over time between two different groups. So here what we're doing is comparing the difference between any robots, the people in the any robot group who received any robot whatsoever versus those that didn't receive a robot at all. And as you can see here, the emotional well-being scale um, was indeed significantly different over time. So those who received, this is very interesting, those who received any robot saw a significant improvement in their emotional well-being compared to those that didn't receive any robot whatsoever. Again, very similar um, outcomes here. This is a comparison between the experimental robot versus the control robot. So this is quite a hard game to play because as I said earlier, the control robot is quite capable but we still saw close to significant improvements in terms of, again, emotional well-being and role limitations emotional uh, between those two uh, uh, robot groups. The experimental robot in particular did very well. And here, when we compare experimental robot versus no robot whatsoever, again, mental health is coming through um, as, as uh, being impact, positively impacted. Again, emotional well-being being significantly uh, improved over time and mental health overall when you looked at it overall and role, emo role limitations emotional uh, were close to significance. Okay um, now just going to briefly talk through the loneliness results. We looked at loneliness using the ULS8 measure which is also a widely used validated measure of loneliness and here a score of 32 represents um, severe loneliness and a score of eight represents known loneliness. So here the higher the score and the closer to 32, 
the worse the, lo the loneliness amount is. So we want to see decreases in the scores here. And as you can see, um, over time, between baseline and at af just after the two-week intervention period, those participants that received a robot, either any robot or an experimental robot or a control robot, they all saw slight decreases in loneliness, just slight. Whereas those people that didn't receive any robot whatsoever saw a slight increase in loneliness, which is again quite interesting. However, when we looked at the statistical uh, uh, magnitude um, in terms of difference, over time, either within group or between group, uh, using Wilcoxon or ANCOVA tests, these changes weren't significant. Um, so uh, we can only say that they are numerically interestingly different, but not significantly different. We also conducted quite a big qualitative component um, with all of the participants that used a robot. So after they'd finished using their robot, after two weeks, we sat them down, conducted semi-structured one-to-one -one qualitative interviews and this revealed ultimately four main themes one of which was the theme of impact upon health and well-being independence and isolation so this was talked about quite a lot um, and as you can see here there was a mixture between people talking about positive impact um, on independence and isolation positive impact on health and well-being um, no impact on independence, health and health, well-being, um, a little bit of positive impact on physical health or no clear impact on health. But as you can see, the important, the important thing to note here is that there were many more references to positive impact, um, either in the form of independence or health and well-being, as compared to the number of references related to no impact. So again, we saw more cases of people talking positively about their experience and it having an impact than not. This is a quick example quote from one English participant. Um, it, was a, it was good in terms of health and well-being. It kept the old brain working really. It made me think, yes, it had the impact on my mental health. It gives me pleasure to talk about my family, to call up music of old any time I choose to pick. So yes, it made me feel good in that respect. Um, there were some study limitations, um, and I just very briefly want to highlight these. So it wasn't a statistically powered trial. Um, it, although it was a very uh, intensive trial and very large, one of the largest ever to have been conducted, particularly using autonomous, as Antonio was describing, autonomous robots, overall it might be viewed that the sample size was quite small. Um, the Japanese data alone was too small to analyze alone and was needed, we needed to group that data with the UK data. Uh, we had non-normal distributions, although that was managed statistically. And although we tried to con control for many confounding variables, and we did, there were likely some confounding variables. So ultimately what this means is that although the results are very interesting and powerful and important, we do need to treat them with caution and not overgeneralize. Just very briefly in terms of conclusions, the results indicate that the system is effective at improving mental health of the older adults in social care settings, even over just a short, short period of two weeks. The experimental robot produced better mental health outcomes than the control robot. Not using a robot produced the worst mental health outcomes. There was no clear impact on physical health. Loneliness slightly reduced for, the, for those people using a robot where it's, whereas it's slightly increased for those that didn't. And as loneliness is very ingrained, as we know in this population, seeing any impact on this measure whatsoever, just over a two week period was particularly positive, I think. And the qualitative analysis clearly reflected all of the quantitative findings, particularly, particularly that the robot positively impacted upon mental health, slightly reduced loneliness, but had no impact on physical health. Thank you very much, that's, that's it from me. Thank you, Chris, for this very detailed and uh, precise presentation in which I just would like to highlight the fact that it was very important as far as, as we understood of the uh, emotional, comp uh, sorry, cultural competence of the robot uh, to enhance uh, well-being in the emotional field. So it's very important uh, as uh, also Antonio already said before and uh, it's uh, we will talk a little bit later in the future perspective. Uh, now I would like to give a speech to 
Michelangelo that will talk about healthcare system uh, developed here in, uh, in Trieste and how it can be used to assist people, please. So, hello everyone once again. Um, today I'm here to talk about uh, Televita, but not Televita under a perspective on an industrial model, <laughs> but more so on the uh, model of Televita uh, and what it represents and what it does and more specifically what it can give in the smart healthcare field. So the first thing that has to be uh, taken in consideration when talking about models of this nature is that they are uh, multi-channel structures. This, this means that it's a complex organism of high technologies that work together to aid the patient or the elderly. First of all, there's telecare, which, is a, uh, which can be also uh, resumed as art services, which uh, vary from telemedicine to domotics, and everything that has to do with the security of the individual, not only from a physical point of view, but an emotional and psychological point of view. We then have the Community Health Call Contact Center, a highly advanced call center that is able to, throughout uh, various uh, channels, uh, direct all kinds of emergencies or problems that have to do with the patients and their needs. And we then have the uh, Community Health Support, which works and is mainly based on telematic services developed to support private and public entities and organizations. The uh, integrated services are services that are custom made for the patient or for the elderly who are in need of a custom made solution, which is something that for us is fundamental and that also links back to what Antonio and Chris talked about. So, uh, for example, we could consider Pepper, which is a cultural, or better, the Caressa software that works in a robot like Pepper, which is culturally competent and that then sends information to Televita that can handle the emergency or that can handle a certain problem and direct uh, the various needs uh, to the doctor, to a family member or to whoever is in charge of the patient or of the uh, elderly. Another important aspect is definitely the telemedicine and, and community health assistance. So having a file and a systematic check for health conditions through uh, a diverse number of performances. Our uh, main objective and the main objective of the Televita model is having the individual at the heart. And this is why we decided to collaborate also with uh, Antonio and with Chris in his research, because through the utilization of highly advanced softwares as caresses, we were, we were able to redirect whatever kind of emergency and whatever kind of problem there may be directly to the competent people. Something that's also very important uh, in this model is the creation of network. We believe in cooperation. We believe that the system works only and only if, if there's a connection between all entities, ranging from public institutions to private institutions. One of our main objectives is to connect and to work as a team. Now I will quickly um, do a brief introduction and examine one of the uh, one of probably the themes that nowadays in the uh, COVID era are being talked about, which are telemedicine and community health assistance. So um, the idea is having a new channel of communication and innovative technologies that can help the patient and that can help the various healthcare systems in handling and monitoring the patients from remote. So I here have. Uh, the name of various devices that can be a, a glucometer, um, that can be a, a spirometer. All of these devices get the information, record the information from remote, and then with various uh, monitoring systems such as the telemonitoring vital parameters, teleconsulting, and remote patient monitoring, can communicate through the patients and through uh, Televita and its call center to the various entities that are responsible for the patients or the elderly's care. And of course, everything can be uh, also programmed 
not only telephonically, but on uh, video calls with the medicines agenda. Uh, something that uh, connects uh, the idea of a software like Caresses and, uh, and a robot like Pepper is housing solutions for the future. So I would like to uh, give this example. Let's say that there's a person, a person who can't live alone because of uh, pathologies or because of uh, physical impediments, and uh, he decides to have a, a housing solution that guarantees independence but at the same time care. What could happen? A robot like Pepper, using the software caresses, could uh, evaluate and could identify a threat or an alarm. This alarm gets sent to the Televita call center, which analyzes and uh, understands the issue, and then directly connects to the person who is responsible for the elderly, or to the person who is uh, curing the elderly, or to the various institutions that need to take action on, a, say, a physical level. Another, oh, sorry. Another uh, fundamental and uh, vital, vital element uh, is data. That is something that we will talk about uh, in the future perspectives uh, part of uh, the panel. Um, that uh, we are very lucky uh, to have. And why is, such, uh, uh, why is this such an important issue? Uh, through uh, obtaining data that is obviously done through devices, interviews and questionnaires, we have the possibility to, to analyze the data. And uh, what happens in analyzing data? We can assess, we can investigate, and we can understand specific patterns that can then help us in the evaluation of the patient's conditions or future needs. And then, obviously, there's the storing part, which is uh, self-explanatory, where Televita uh, uh, keeps the data, stores it, and can then, and this is where the future, uh, the future question stands, that can then use this data for other projects or other researches or other investigations. Thank you very much for the attention. We will proceed with the panel. Yes. Thank you so much, Michelangelo, because you, thank you, <laughs> because, uh, you gave us uh, uh, several examples of how these uh, technologies can merge. And um, so now we will have a, a brief discussion about uh, how uh, these technologies can be developed in the next year, so future perspectives of these uh, systems. Uh, but before starting uh, this part, I would like to, to ask a brief question to, to Antonio. Um, we, we saw your, uh, this, uh, this uh, somehow uh, wonderful robot uh, that you use it in an um, uh, experimental environment, but at the state of the art uh, of this uh, technology, you can use it also by your own at home? Or that, that, That's a very interesting question, also because <clears throat> people that work in robotics are very used to build uh, demonstrations or experimental setup that do not exist in the real world, of course. Uh, of, this is similar in our case, but only partially because this was the product of uh, a research project. So the pro research project has not the objective of creating a product, especially this kind of research project. But let me take it that the function, let me say to you that the functionality that you saw, in principle, they are ready to be used by anybody in a robot that you can put in your house. So my answer would be yes, yes. you could use it by, on your own. There are, however, many other issues which are related to make software with industrial standards, with no flaws, with no bugs, which is 100% reliable, which is nothing to do with the intelligent part of the system, but that were not the aim For the of, more technical of the project. Part, there are more yeah. technical issues. And, and, and so these kind of things are things that would require a, a path towards, let's say, to, to, towards the market if you want to have okay. it in, in the real world. Okay. Uh, okay, let's have a look on the future now then. Okay, okay. Yeah. Should I show you uh, Yeah, there is a slide, yeah, slide uh, a couple of slides. The future? Here we go. Of course, not the future of everything, but only related to this. <laughs> so they, our... Our path, our idea, um, not only mine, but Chris and other people which were involved in caresses, is relates both to research, so through additional research projects, uh, additional investigations, additional trials with people, but also 
to, let's say, a path to the market in some sense. So we are considering b both these paths. And the, the idea, what we are got, trying to do is to apply the same principle, but to any smart device, which can be small toy robots, assistant, the one with two blue eyes that you can see is Pillow, which is a pill dispenser that works as a pill dispenser, but can take benefit of the additional feature of, the, of our system, or even just smart environment with smart sensors, smart lamps, or smart plugs, and so on. So the idea is that we want to take devices with no or reduced functionalities for social assistance, and uh, what we would like is to uh, sell, if you want, or to give to producers the opportunity to connect to our system. So maybe uh, the producers of Pillow, they are not interested in social assistance. Our best core business is something different. But they may connect to our system on the cloud to add uh, social interaction functionalities. And this is to give the possibility to people to buy devices with the additional functionalities for cultural competent social assistance. But there is another path which is equally interesting, which is the possibility of people that already own devices. So uh, maybe I own an Alexa, which I can only use for doing the things that were initially expected from Alexa. But then what we are going to do is to develop software layers that enable you to connect your own Alexa that you already own to the, uh, oh, this is called the Caregiver Cloud, which is the name of the next step. Uh, it was caresses, now it will be Caregiver because we want to give culturally competent AI to everybody, so it becomes Caregiver. <laughs> okay, so this is what we are going to do in the future. And as I'm saying, we are following this path both through new research projects because there are many things that need to be done to make this concept of cultural competence uh, uh, possible for every device. So there are many research topics to be investigated, but we are also investigating the possibility of uh, uh, following a commercial path if there are partners that are interested to work with us in this. Okay, thank you so much. Thank and you. Michelangelo, uh, previously you talked about uh, data and uh, use them, uh, store them, analyze them. Uh, I would like to understand and make people understand which is the main challenge that uh, an healthcare, a smart healthcare system such as Televita has to face when to, uh, has to carry on about researches and analysis about this data and which are the main projects that you would like to do with, with them, with this kind of data in the, in the near future. So thank you very much for the question. First of all, we have to keep in consideration and keep in mind that when talking about data, there's a main limitation which stands within privacy. So uh, the Televita model deals with very, very sensitive data that is also pass, uh, passed and connected to the national healthcare systems, which obviously means that there has to be a collaboration with the public institutions. So when dealing with this kind of data, analyzing, uh, storing, and obtaining this data has to follow a very strict procedure, which uh, obviously is, is fundamental and is important because one of the main things with uh, these very advanced technologies is that we want to um, maintain data, we want to store it, but we don't want to have any <laughs> leaks or anything, uh, or anything along those lines because we're talking about very, very sensitive data. So I would say that the main limitation also in analysis is privacy. So knowing what you're searching for, understanding the needs of the patients, but also respecting uh, the privacy and the Italian and European protocols that uh, are, are in place when dealing with this, uh, with this, uh, with this data. Uh, when talking about projects and future projects, uh, something that uh, data can always be used for is to improve the system that is in place, understand uh, what can be done better, and, uh, and starting from there, there could be the possibility of the development also with the advancement of technologies with uh, cloud caregivers and um, uh, robots and uh, everything that can uh, improve smart healthcare, uh, what can be done from there. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, a very quick question to, to Chris that I know that is still, uh, is still connected because uh, uh, you show us, uh, here we go, uh, you show us some uh, uh, um, 
surprising results uh, of this uh, of application of these systems with elderly people, but I think that they can be used also with the other uh, kind of population. I mean, people that maybe are um, facing some uh, physical uh, traumas, uh, or uh, we, we understood in this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, period, lockdown period, that uh, social isolation is something that can happen to everyone. So uh, are you thinking about making other experimental uh, uh, studies with other kind of people, other kind of demographics? Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. We're always interested in exploring this with other demographics. But as you said, I think the ultimately it's about, you know, the potential impact and use that the system can have. So indeed, I think social isolation, loneliness, uh, poor mental health, uh, those sorts of things are really the, the outcomes of interest that I think we need to, to target. Because ultimately, the whole point of this is to improve quality of life, right? And so we need to target those people that, you know, are going to benefit the most from these kinds of systems. And that's really why in our project so far, we've targeted older adults because older adults, of course, there are different types of older adult populations, right? You have those living quite independently, often in the community or those in quite um, substantial care settings with substantial care needs. But regardless, um, overall, older adults are, as we've seen in COVID-19, a very vulnerable, particularly vulnerable population. You know, they're more likely to have frailty. You know, they're more likely to have uh, chronic diseases and chronic conditions. They're more likely to have dementia. They've got a stronger fear of, of death and mortality, a fear of their illness um, and health progressively uh, deteriorating. You know, and as you said, um, uh, isolation, loneliness, but also very importantly with older adults, there is the issue of dignity and um, uh, 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 that's a very important aspect of all of this. And when people, particularly older adults, feel isolated, they don't feel that they're contributing to society as much as perhaps they used to, that they're not, you know, able, you know, they're not physically able to partake in you know, social customs and uh, things that, you know, give them value, self-efficacy, then they can experience a loss of dignity. And this is very poisonous for mental health. So if this system, if these kinds of artificially intelligent, culturally competent systems can bring people together, can make vulnerable populations feel like they have more, more to give, feel that like they have more self-value, self-efficacy, improve their confidence, connect people, as Antonio was saying earlier about connection, um, and just really get them talking about things that they value, because talking is great for cognitive health. Then, you know, I really do think that across all different types of populations, but particularly older adults, we're going to see an impact, as we saw in our trial. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you to everyone. We are perfectly on time, so we have more or less eight minutes to... Uh receive some uh, questions from the audience uh, if you have to ask something to our speakers here or uh, in remote please i don't know if there is a mic Uh, I know about the crisis project, but uh, I think I didn't ask this before. And how are the cultural basis of knowledge in, in paper built, the different ones? And, um, and I was wondering, how flexible are they? Does paper learn from interaction with the patients and uh, about the specific culture? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, this is different. The answer is different related to caresses and what we are going to do in the close future. In caresses, the cultural knowledge base has been built through uh, the dialogue with experts in cultural competence. 
So one of the partners in the project uh, was an expert in transcultural nursing and cultural competent healthcare. So what happened is that we started from knowledge from expert. So the idea is to uh, understand which are the important things for this particular uh, for older adults uh, with this uh, background culture. And this was used to add information to the cultural knowledge base. So in the previous version, the flexibility was only related on uh, not acquiring new concepts, but using what the robot already knows and to, through, let's say, conversation to understand if these things, the initial assumption, are really valid for this person. So, for instance, the robot in the current version will never learn uh, that uh, sushi exists if nobody put it in the knowledge base. But the robot may understand that for this person, sushi is something the person is familiar with, or even more, make more complex inferences. For instance, the robot is talking with, uh, uh, let's say, a German person, and by talking with the Japanese person, understand that the person likes uh, uh, Japanese art. And maybe the person has sushi once per week. And so the robot may understand more generally on a, on a probabilistic sense that the person is interested in Japanese culture. So the robot evolves, but without adding new concepts. So what we are doing in the future is exactly to give the possibility the system to add new concepts which do not exist in real time. This is one of the purpose of, now, of the evolution of the system. But Antonio, correct me if I'm wrong. At the moment, the, the robot is, so, is a, a person related. I mean, if we are both in the same room talking with the, with the robot, yes. it, it, he this, tells, is, uh, this is only for technical reasons, because it's a little more complex to distinguish between two persons. Okay. And since we had an objective in the project, yeah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, sorry, uh, if I may say, there was also a reason for this. When you start learning from scratch, it becomes very dangerous, uh, because the robot can learn everything. There are many examples in the recent literature about this. So, what we want to do is to have something which was fully validated by the experts in our group, and this is what they did. So they could validate an ontology which already exists, but you cannot make prediction about what the system is adding during the interaction. I would also like to, to stress and add just like <laughs> one single point to give, I would say, a context or maybe uh, the, the, the size dimension of this smart, smart healthcare market right now because we're talking of a market that in 2023 is going to reach the 200 billion dollar mark so it's a market that's slowly uh, advancing in the last 10 years but that will rapidly advance in uh, in in this particular time period especially for the needs that this uh, historic period and uh, uh, this covid era is bringing upon us so uh, it's a market that has a lot of room uh, it's a market that has uh, a lot of potential and uh, one of the main research gaps, for example, I remember when I've done a research on uh, how uh, healthcare, or better, how telecare and telehealth uh, can ameliorate the Italian healthcare systems, one of the main research gaps uh, that uh, were highlighted was the, the fact that there's not a lot of Italian-based uh, uh, companies that work within this field. So it's definitely a market that uh, has a lot of potential of growth, which I think is really important for future perspective. Also because of uh, aging population. That, uh, exactly, the is. incredibly in, uh, high demographic in Greece in these last few years, and obviously the elderly population growing brings about uh, the question or what are we going to do when there's going to be so many people to take care of. And I think that these are possible solutions to do so. Okay. Any, any other questions? No? Okay. So uh, thank you so much to everyone.